This is the Creator Podcast. I am Gus, and I have with me Jeff. I'm Jeff, yeah. That's right. And on today's episode, we're very excited. We got Mario Torres. Am I saying your name right, Mario? Yes, yes. Awesome. Hi. Yeah, I got, ner- I got nervous because I was like, wait, uh, I hope I don't say it wrong. Mario, you've done so many amazing things. It's kind of like what every child aspires to be. So how, how do you do it? Um, it, it, it's really, uh, being inspired by other artists and filmmakers and, you know, all every, uh, you know, every creative outlet and, and, uh, um, you know, that, that, uh, I, I've, I've been inspired ever since I was a kid. Um, I used to watch a lot of TV, <laughs> um, and I, you know, how, how old are you guys, by the way? I am. Uh, I'm 480, but I, I tell people I'm 41 just to keep it. You know, I don't want people looking into my situation. But and Jeff's like 36. I'm, I'm mid 30s. Okay, so so we kind of all grew up watching the same kind of stuff. But I mean, they, you know, I used to watch a lot of TV, and and they used to they used to have this TV show called the Family Film Festival, which was which ran on the weekends. And, and I watched everything from Bruce Lee movies to, to Godzilla movies, um, you know, uh, animation films. Uh, yeah. I would watch, you know, during the week after school, they would, ha- they would run, like, uh, various cartoons like Robotech and Transformers and, you know, He-Man, the Masters of the Universe, tons of stuff. So I, I think it was just that kind of childhood kind of experience of watching and drawing as a kid and watching other artists and you know even if there was somebody in my classroom that used to draw because i started out drawing uh before sculpting and and uh um you know and and i i I think that helped me when i transitioned into sculpting uh to to kind of wrap my head around um making something that was you know practical yeah, I'm going to quickly interrupt. So right now, Mario's sculpting something. That's what that noise is that we're hearing. Uh, but Mario works in the industry. For, he, he's done, if you if you have a favorite movie or show, he might have worked on it. Uh, I was looking at his Instagram and scrolling, and, and Jeff was too. And like I couldn't believe how many amazing projects you've worked on. I've been very fortunate. Um, you know, I, I um, when you... I got in the business in 1994, like late 94. And, um, you know, I, I busted my ass for, you know, I mean, I still bust my ass uh, working. But uh, even back then, you know, I was really ambitious and, and, and wanted to do this stuff uh, even before, you know, all throughout high school. Um it's a, it's a really kind of, you know, I, 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 at my high school, uh, we were fortunate enough to have this, this, uh, this animation program. I went to Roland High School out here in, um, it's not like L.A., it's like east of L.A., but um, it was in California. Um, and and at, at my high school, we had this animation program, which you could do... 2D traditional uh, animation, and then you can also do stop motion animation. And then after school, we had a somebody somebody that went to that school started. Hey, you know they they started the class after school. It was an after school ROP class. And like, wow, wouldn't that be cool if we could have like a mask making class after school? Oh wow! And and. Uh, so they did that, and the, I took I, I took that. I was actually taking architect classes, architectural classes, and my friend Edwin, he, he uh, you know, uh, you know, he, he's passed away already. He died of cancer at forty five, but um, he's the one that I have to thank because he was the one that introduced me to this stuff. I, I was, you know, I, I was uh, I was taking drafting classes because I wanted to be an architect, and he's like. He said, "You got to take this class next semester." And um, and I said, where, what, "What class is that?" He's like, "There's this animation class where you can make little movies and all this stuff." And I was like, "What? No way!" Wow. I, I I went to the school and I didn't even know about this program until I actually <laughs> took it. But 
But um, but it was an amazing class, and I guess the teacher there used to work for Warner Brothers, yeah. and, and other other studios. And and what happened was that he got he got like Warner Brothers and all and, and I don't know who else, but they donated like over a million dollars worth of and their old animation equipment. Oh wow! And their cameras and. Um, so, so I the following semester, I, I listened to my friend. I took the class. We went to a. Have you guys heard of, of a Fangoria convention? Uh, I know the magazine, but I, yes, I guess they have a convention based on it. Yeah. Do you guys know? Um, uh, you guys know Monster Palooza, right? Yeah. 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 I, I've. I think we. I, I've worked one of them. I think oh. the last the one out in L.A. Right. Yeah. But. But. You know, Fangoria Weekend of Horrors used to be the equivalent of what Monster Palooza is now, um, and, and it was it was really it, it was about the same. You know, it was about the same. But I went. They, my friend Scott Sureg and Edwin Roselle, um, uh, you know, the guy who introduced me to the animation program. He he uh, they they took me uh, one week into this convention. I was like, oh my god, I'm so sold. Like I, this is what I want to do now. <laughs> and. Yeah. Uh, so then, so then, like, so then, like, uh, uh, I, I took the animation class um, and made little stop motion animation. I took the after school ROP class, but then, you know, part of me was was still wanting to 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 keep doing the architectural class. Yeah. And, and I went to I went to my teacher, um, uh, and. and uh, and I asked him, "Hey, you know, I'm still interested in architecture. Uh, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to take your class as well as the animation class the following semester." Semester, and and um, it was really heartbreaking because he he he's he's like, "Well, why do you want to take this class? Aren't you happy over there?" <laughs> <laughs> and it it, it kind of it made my heart sink. Like, wow, like. You know, because I, I was a straight A student in his class, and and um, and I I really busted my butt to to try to impress him because he came from the tech background. So that was a that was a huge discouragement. And then afterwards, I was just like, well, f him. I'm just gonna <laughs> I'm just gonna keep doing uh, you know uh, uh, makeup effects, and so that's how I got into that. Nice. Wow, so that, that's awesome. Yeah, and so you dropped you dropped out of his class from that. You said I didn't take it the following semester, and I just continued with the animation program at Roland High School. Um, oh, nice. I think that the program, though, because I I've heard um, uh, that uh, sadly enough the the program has dissolved ever since the um, the teacher Robin Masters left. Um, but uh, you know. Uh, it, and and also too, I mean, uh, he kind of discouraged me too. It, it's funny how like what a teacher says could really cause an impact in your life. You know, yeah. Uh, you kind of you kind of start to create self doubt in yourself, and 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 to wonder like, wow, can I really can I really do it now? You know, because I remember my animation teacher. You know, I I busted my ass. I was doing this animation short with a friend of mine we were you know they say they put you in groups so you had to do it both of, i mean it's a tremendous amount of work i don't know if you guys have ever done a stop motion animation film but it's an immense amount of work um we would stay constantly after school to to um uh you know to animate and um you know i ended up pretty much doing the film all by myself and then my friend got the a as well <laughs> um yeah. Um, but you know, my teacher, he said to me, he's like, it's funny though. He's like, Mario, he's like, it's funny though. The people that really want it the most never make it. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's, that's pretty discouraging. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it seems was... like almost like he was, he was kind of saying that, oh, you need to, you need to do the easy thing because there's no future for an, any kind of animator or anything, which is maybe he was playing it safe, but it's definitely, it sounds like what it was is you found your passion and you basically just, you know, there's no way that you could turn around on that. You found something you fell in love with and, you know, the proof is that you've been doing it for so long. Absolutely. And, and, and you know what? It actually, it kind of fueled me in, in the sense that I was mm -hmm. like, you know what? I'm going to prove him wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? 
and, and and I don't know if he was just messing with me. Was he doing reverse psychology, or you know who knows? But but it, it gave me it gave me a sense of fuel to kind of try to prove him wrong, you know. And um, it, it was a great feeling to finally get get in the business and 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 work on multiple TV shows. But it's like one of those things where, you know, you I I really busted my ass, and I, I like I said, I still do, and and. Um, and from that, I just it just became word of mouth. Like I would get onto jobs, and I wouldn't really need to interviews. Like once jo- one job finished, uh, I, I, you know, thankfully, like I'd get a phone call saying, "Hey, are you available to sculpt?" And then I just kind of kept going from there, you know. And 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 the thing is, like I used to work for Kevin Yeager for many years. Do you guys know Kevin Yeager? He did uh, Chucky films, Crypt Keeper. Um, I, I know, I know. Of those, I'm big fans of those, but the name sounds kind of familiar. Uh, he was, is he like one of the special effects masters on those? Oh yeah, I mean, you know, he's he's done tons of big projects. I mean, I, I worked with him on Face Off, Sleepy Hollow, uh, Starship Troopers, um, a number of other films. But um, you know, it wasn't until I left because I ended up being there for four years, and then things got you know, a little bit funny, whatever is things do at jobs, but I ended up leaving there. But, you know, Kevin was very kind in the sense that he, you know, he got, he got his, he took care of his crew. He got all of us, you know, most of us into SAG, which was, we were in SAG for puppeteering. Um, you know, back in the day, they used to make films where we would have puppets and they'd, they'd puppeteer um now that's very uh, very rare and unlikely they uh, obviously they still do it once in a while but um you know if you get if you get a chance to do a sag uh puppeteering job it's very rare yeah. and when you say puppeteering that's that's completely different than animatronics right you're saying actually like a hand in, in like moving a mouth that kind of puppeteering like old yoda kind of stuff no 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 it, it goes hand in hand with animatronics it actually is animatronics so like I worked on Bride of Chucky, and then, you know, Kevin had uh, numerous uh, in- engineers that that handcrafted the animatronics and put servos in the Chucky head, and you know, made it move and all that stuff. Um, and then, and then we would take it a set, and there'd be, you know, three guys with remote controls, kind of um, puppeteering the, you know, the the heads. And and so you'd have like three people in the head, you'd have one person doing one arm, another person doing another arm, and then you'd have one person doing the the finger movement on, for both the hands. It it was it was a it was a crazy ensemble of of people trying to orchestrate like one movement, and it was it, it you know it, it was great because. Uh, Kevin kind of auditioned all of us. He he made us do, he made us all try every part. Like, you know, we we kind of all rotated, and then it was really smart of him because then he took whatever people were strongest at, and then he would put them in that category. Like, I ended up doing the the girl Tiffany's eyes for the film. Um. Uh. So you know it. it even though you're 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 kind of moving a little joystick up and down, you really still had to kind of uh, set a kind of emotion for that character. Uh, and everybody everybody everybody's part was just as important as the other person's uh, because we all had to work together as a team. Right, right. Yeah, it just it sounded like what you're saying was potentially that uh, more and more less puppeteering or or even practical effects. Are being are being used? They're getting replaced with like CGI and digital. Um, yeah, is that kind of what you're saying? Pretty much, yeah. I I, I was uh, you know John Fabrio, which you know he uh, he created the the uh, Mandalorian TV yeah. show. I yeah, you know, I, as I was kind of finishing up at Legacy, um, like um, in like July 2018, they were they were doing the Baby Yoda. For the for the show, and I was I was pretty excited about that because John Fabrio is is a big uh, 
big time uh, lover of practical effects, you know, and just very much like Guillermo del Toro, uh, as much as practical effects that could be used, they will use it. Even though, even if people think or know that it's a puppet, um, I think, you know, they obviously they grew up around the same time as I did. Um, and, you know, we grew up in a time where in the 80s, there was no CGI. Everything had to be done practically. And, right. and I think that's why they have so much love for the craft that um, they still kind of gravitate towards it and want to do it as much as they can. And, you know, he did that on, on Baby Yoda for, for the TV show, which is great. I was like, wow, I wish I, I, wish I could have puppeteered on that. <laughs> yeah i think um one of the biggest examples i can think of now is i don't know if you've seen the newest uh dark crystal reboot the age of resistance um but it's it's like pretty much almost all practical effects there's you know there's because well i mean it's basically henson you know um so right. there's, there's obvious that the want to be able to do that and when i saw that i thought that was amazing and i love that they were using practical effects it, it it was amazing i i only saw the first episode um but I actually got called for that job because um, I had wor- I'd worked there back in 2000 on Country Bears, and um, uh, you know, you know when you work really hard on a show, I think people really remember that, and they want to call you back whenever they can get you in, whenever you're not busy or whatever. But um, I got called about that show, but I was at Legacy working on probably Avengers or. Um, something else but but i i really wanted to work on that show um it would have been a lot of fun because i i love that film and um it would have been nice to have been a part of that yeah that seemed like an awesome project yeah and you you said like so i've, I've seen like you worked at a lot of different studios i'm wondering like as you know somebody that that works at a lot of different studios do you feel like you have and an allegiance to a certain studio or do you kind of bounce around where the work is and then you kind of bounce back and forth between studios or do you find yourself kind of working at one studio for a while and kind of moving on or, or, or does it kind of change? Um, it's a couple of different things. Uh, you know, uh, I, I've been really fortunate to have worked at pretty much every studio in town. <laughs> yeah. It seemed that way from looking at a lot of the stuff you post. Yeah. And, and, um, but you know what though? Like, I I felt after I left Kevin's, I had worked there four years. Um, after that, I was kind of just floating around everywhere. But I feel like at the time that was a really good thing because it exposed me to working around a lot of very talented artists, you know, which which inspired me even before I got in the business. And um, who inspired me? even before I got into business. But, uh, you know, so so I, I, I liked the idea of kind of floating around because I, I feel like as an artist, like if you feel like you, 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 you know everything, it kind of creates you from, you, 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 I don't know, this is just me personally, but I feel like if I just work, if I were to work, if I were to just stay at Kevin's shop, right, for example, um, I feel like I wouldn't have grown as much, uh, you know, for myself as trying to do better work. Uh, you know, like the idea of just always wanting to learn and never stop growing, you know, um, I think I was exposed to so many different artists working from, you know, working at Stan Winston's to Rick Baker's that I was, I was okay with floating around. Uh, I actually like that better because when you get, when you work at one place, um, you know, you're, you're there for like three, four years. Um, you know, I, I, I feel like you're kind of more limited as opposed to working around other artists, you know, and I, I was really inspired by a lot of artists that are my friends now. And, and, um, you know, I think one of the one of the funnest shows I I think I was gonna go back to one of your questions. One well, one of the funnest shows that I, I really worked on was uh, was working for Rick Baker on Men in Black Three. Um, there was a there was an immense amount of creative force that was working there that 
I became hugely inspired by it and, and it made me want to try harder or, or just kind of be in this really crazy creative mindset, you know, and, and everybody's feeding off each other. And, uh, it was, and I'll say this, I, I, I've said this before to a friend who also worked there. He did all the dentures, uh, for the show, but it, I felt like it was a, a very magical moment almost. Yeah, that, that was my favorite Men in Black. I, I thought that was a... I wasn't a big Men in Black fan, but I saw that for a dollar in theaters somewhere, and I was blown away. It was just... Uh, yeah, it was a really, really fun one. So I, I see what you're saying with that. that special projects, for sure. Definitely. Uh, but I've, had, I've had a lot of fun at every, pretty much every studio um, that I've worked with. Uh, I've worked with... The, the thing is, like, there's so many different personalities, and, you know, I'm... You know, I, I'm there, there's so many different personalities and, and, you know, creativity around and egos and all yeah. sorts of other stuff that it kind of makes makes it really kind of interesting. And it kind of it's captivating in the sense that it makes you feel like, wow, we're all in this kind of melting pot of artists that um you know, even if there's drama that week or that day, or we're all stressed out about uh, 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 deadlines, that we all kind of are still having fun. We're, we're all big kids, you know. Yeah, for sure. Um, so if if you were doing a set like Men in Black or, or something like that, and someone came up to you and said, "Hey, you know, here in the back, like we don't, we, we just want to test this out. We have a real time machine." We want you to go wherever you want. Would you Would you hop in it? Would you actually go on a journey like that? What do you think you would do? Oh my God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> where, where would you go first? Like, how would you like? You know, they're like, you could pick any year you want, but like, you have no guarantee you're going to come back. Like, that's it's part of it's part of this. <laughs> they just want they just want to see what goes on. They're like, what better way to test it than bring it to a movie studio? Oh man, I, okay. I have to tell you before I answer that question. I have to tell you a little <laughs> story. Um, sure. Before I got in the business, I had this crazy dream that I was walking around like I, I don't. I don't even know what studio it was, but it was like it was on a movie lot set, and it was on a studio set. And I was walking around. Have you guys ever been? to or gotten a tour on a on a movie studios no uh, no i don't think no, I've, I've, I've been to the the jim henson studio in new york but that was about it oh that's cool um was it was it good was it cool oh oh yeah it was amazing like there's just so much stuff i wanted to touch and, and there's foam and fur everywhere and like there's like people there like that's awesome. uh, like we met a bunch of people that like worked on sesame street and stuff like legends who worked on like labyrinth and yeah, it was amazing. I got to see Cookie Monster, like the real one, <laughs> Snuffleupagus. Oh yeah, it was great. But anyway, you know that too that that foam that foam doesn't hold up for very long. It kind of ends up crumbling and turning hard, which is kind of a given with that kind of material. You know, like anything, it, it wears out. Um, but uh, uh, so yeah, I, I remember just in this dream that I had, like walking around this movie studio before I got in the business. And then when I finally, I remember I was on Starship Troopers. This was probably about, you know, anywhere between four to six years later that I was walking down uh, a studio on, on, on Starship Troopers. And I remember and I remembered that dream. I was like, wow, I, I don't know what this means, but this is fucking cool. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 that's kind of like when I take think back in retrospect about that dream and then that thought and then me, me uh, c being on that lot, it feels like I time traveled and yeah, and because I worked really hard to get where I'm at now. I felt it, it felt right, you know? So, so to answer your question, where would I go? Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I think I would go, um, you know, maybe time travel to 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 maybe that show that I didn't do that I wish I did, and if I would have said yes, what yeah. would have happened? You know, 
Right. Well, I mean, it's an interesting thing you said uh, with the dream. I, I think, you know, I had a recent conversation with Jeff about dreams. And, and it, to me, it kind of shows that there is destiny for us and that it exists and that things are kind of meant to be. And I almost feel like that was a, a reminder that you're on your right you're on the right track for your life. You know, like you're doing exactly what you should be doing. I, I totally agree with you. And, and I think that if you really are, are a hard worker and really ambitious about what you really love to do, then, then you'll get there. Yeah, for, for sure. I, I say that all the time as well. It's kind of like you, uh, you make your life. People don't want that pressure on themselves. They, they want to feel like there's this, luck to it and like you know people just get lucky but i think you sort of make your own luck through how you treat others and how hard you work at something for, for sure absolutely. absolutely yeah i think we, we touch on that a little bit on the show the the idea that this almost self-fulfilling prophecy where if, if you're positive and you put in the hard work and you have kind of these goals like oh i want to you know one day work in a movie studio or whatever it is and you constantly work towards that well it's not that it just magically comes true but it's kind of this thing that you've seen and, and it, and it comes true because of the hard work you put in. And I hear, and you probably get this a lot. I hear a lot of people say like, Oh, you're so talented. And it's kind of like, well, I wasn't born being able to make special effects makeup. Like I've worked my ass off and just calling it talent. It kind of takes away a little bit from that. Do you ever, do you feel the same way about that? Yeah. Cause, uh, I mean, it, it does take a lot of hard work and you know, I, I do believe, though, it comes easier for some people than others. Oh, yeah, completely. But I, but I think all we all have to work just as hard. Um, you know, whether it's a, a sculpture or a painting. Um, uh, you know, like one of the things I want to ask Gus was that... It, and and I, I still struggle with this, um, trying to find your kind of niche or, or vibe as an artist. And I, I actually asked my friend, I don't know if you guys know Chad Czar, yeah. um, the fantastical painter, I mean, of just surrealism and, and um, these crazy, really cool characters. I, I, I met Chad years ago. We worked together, I think, Spectral Motion. Um, but... Um, uh, you know, I asked I asked him one day. He, he I remember Chet when he was. We were working together on some show. I forgot what it was, but um, you know, I said, "Hey, man, you want to you want to grab lunch some sometime?" And and then every time I hit him up, he's like, "Oh, he's like, I'm I I, I have to coat my painting with uh with some enamel at lunch." And I remember like, wow, like he would. I was like, fuck, he's really, uh, <laughs> you know, like, he doesn't even want to eat. <laughs> uh, he keeps going. But but I remember him doing that, and now he's like, I'm so happy for him because I remember before, you know, he had, he had really made it in that world. And I asked him, like, how did you find your niche? Like, what did you do? Like, I, you know, I'm still trying to find my voice as an artist, like, trying to, because I'd love to do just, you know, even what you do, Gus, like you've really captivated a lot, a lot of people in the sense that you've really kind of created that your own style, your own way. How did you how did you do that? Like what? Oh, oh thank you. Um, well, yeah, not, I have well, to know. <laughs> well, for sure. Well, you know, the way it really started, which is, I guess, the best way to, to, to explain is, um. When I was a little kid, when I was about nine years old, I used to think that everybody, when they closed their eyes, could see thousands of creatures. Uh, I, I thought everyone, I thought everyone had that. Like, like I just thought, you know, we could dream, we could think. I, I didn't really understand, and I, I said to myself, why don't I try to draw one of those creatures that I see, one of those characters? So, I, first one, I, you know, I zoned in on it, pulled them out did my best job and I was a terrible artist. Like I was, no one ever thought I was anything special at all. I didn't, they never pulled me aside and said, you got it kid. So it, <laughs> it, it was this, but, but I, but it was my own guy. It was my own little figure and, and my mom helped me name him. And that was the start of it. And it was just like, I realized it took me a long time to realize like, wait, not everybody could do that. And 
that's my favorite thing about creating is is um you know and right in front of me right now making this medusa piece somebody was like you should make medusa but what i did is i thought it's gonna it's gonna start it off really shitty and really bad and, and crude which is just my true nature and then just you kind of zone i kind of zone out and i just uh it's like i'm entertaining myself or like oh you could try this and maybe that will happen that'll make it look better and that looks so all the things that look wrong and are definitely wrong by any high art society standard, I just kind of use it to my advantage, and, and all I'm going for is something that makes me feel really happy in the end. So it, it's a very true to me kind of nature. Uh, and then and then if I'm really not feeling it, or you almost forget who you are almost every day as as an as an artist. I think that's like because in today's world there's so many influences everywhere it's like ah and distractions or maybe i should be doing that or maybe i should do you know so you kind of have to retouch who you are all the time i think that that helps me kind of or i'll even look back on my older pieces and i go oh yeah i remember what i did there i should go back to that a little bit you know you kind of have to always guide the ship awesome so 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 you're saying that when when you found the happiness in yourself like doing that character that certain way that you're like wow that's that's my niche kind of thing or style or yeah it it felt like it was it felt like it was mine and and then I had to um you know I really had to develop it and then as a late teenager I kind of started getting really influenced by things and and then you know for a few years I was like just drawing combo characters that weren't mine but around 19 i went back to saying like i'm just gonna do my things i'm just want to do that and and now i still do pop culture stuff just to reel people in just to kind of be like hey i know you love this character now you can check out my other stuff um i think you kind of if you want to get a yeah. mass audience until, until you're like world famous and everybody knows you for your you know your characters it, it helps yeah. me but uh but i always try to do my spin on it you know if it's somebody else's character awesome yeah it, it's um i was talking to a friend it's like wow you you kind of we all kind of have to play the game you know and uh we all have to kind of like kind of please ourselves but we want to please everybody else as well and yeah. i definitely want to you know when i work at a studio um i i definitely want to I want them to be happy, you know. I've I've worked with Del Toro and Christopher Nolan, and you know, when when I've worked for those guys, like they have different distinct styles, obviously. Right. Um, but when I worked for 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 Nolan, I was like, "There's no way I could sculpt this Bane mask like I would <laughs> for Guillermo Del Toro film." You know what I mean? Yeah. So, right. So you have to kind of get in that really weird not weird but different mindset in the sense that okay uh i'm i'm working for him i okay obviously i've seen some of his movies like how how do i kind of channel uh you know his his kind of vibe you know for sure i I was gonna ask you i mean you know you being around these geniuses of the of the industry of the world in, in a sense modern day is there any similarities that they have like is there any like trait that these kind of people have you know that you that you pick up on um i mean uh yeah yes and no i i I guess i i um okay well let's see if i can answer this uh the right way um like let's take Guillermo and and um, and Christopher Nolan. Um, I I think that it's not easy, for example, for either of them to kind of um, try to convey an idea uh, to be realistic in the sense that okay, like this girl Guillermo's film, Shape of Water, this girl's gonna fall in love with this fish guy. <laughs> You know that's that that's a pretty obscure, <laughs> wild idea, um, and then and then you take Christopher Nolan, which is like, okay, this guy has to wear this crazy breathing apparatus that he needs to to stay alive. Um, 
But I think the thing that that ties a, those two amazing directors together is the that they 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 thought okay how how can we make this as grounded as possible in the sense that um you know if, if i'm making a fish guy a fish creature in a movie how do i make him believable and 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 fall in love with this girl you know little alone enough uh and and, and nolan you know it's like how do i make this guy that that ha has been in one, I guess, one of the film that I could think of, Batman Forever, uh, Bane, uh, a, a believable character that people are are, are gonna and character and grounded character that people are gonna um, believe that this guy can actually exist in in our world, and I think that's that's kind of what those guys have in common um, that they made those uh, those characters work for those films, you know. Yeah, that's that's an awesome point, and, and it makes a lot of sense. And I, I saw that uh, Nolan was doing that when he took on Batman. He wanted to make everything very realistic, as if it was actually happening. So, uh, yeah, that's... I remember, you know, when I got when I got on board uh, for for The Shape of Water, they already had been working on the film, just in like uh, you know three three uh, D printed maquettes and and. Um, uh, 2D designs <coughs> for the excuse me for the character, um, and and the it, it had really evolved, you know. So what it ended up being in the film, um, it, it it became. I saw, you know, I just saw the designs, and it really evolved into this more practical kind of character that can actually be believable. Yeah, that's that's it's so cool just. You know, diving into those little those productions a little bit, uh, it's it's definitely exciting for. You know, I've been obsessed with that kind of stuff my whole life, so it's uh it's, it's so I don't know, just overwhelmingly awesome. Cool. Yeah, I wanted to like so you know basically your your vague title is special effects artist, and I'm not sure a lot of people know like what goes into that i know that you know maybe people think you know you're working on a sculpture right now so obviously you're a sculptor but i'm not sure a lot of people know that there's like this whole other process of like mold making and casting and painting and i know you do it all is there when you're brought into a project do you kind of know what you're getting into do you usually have one one job that you're you're there to do like oh you're, you're just going to be you know sculpting on this project or we need you to sculpt and make the mold or or is it kind of all over the place uh, that's a very good question. Um, it's really interesting. Um, you know, when, when I worked, for example, at Legacy, um, I was, e even though I was maybe sometimes put uh, to slightly art direct there, um, you know, uh, the the only thing that I, I would art direct at Legacy were my sculptures and the way that I wanted to break the makeup down, for example. Um, but but as far as the overall show, um, I was just a sculptor. Um, I have been on shows where, for example, I, you know, there's a recent recent post of um, this kind of creature suit that I sculpted at uh, ADI. And um, I, I was hired to kind of art direct that project, which was a lot of fun. I mean, it's I love art directing and, and sculpting at the same time. So when you're when you're involved in, or put in that position, uh, it's a lot more liberating and a lot more creatively. Uh, um, um, God, <laughs> I'm stuck for that word, but um, you know, it, it's a lot it's a lot more forgiving and, and better as an artist to kind of be in that position, but I'm never always in that position. Um, and, and I'm fine with that because I feel sometimes when you are in that position, you, you are given the responsibility of one character to, to see it all the way through from all angles from I'm talking like mold making, painting, all that stuff. It could be very stressful, you know, because mm -hmm. you're 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 working with a whole team of people, and you kind of have to 
you kind of like an, a, a director in that sense. You have to really orchestrate the whole job and see it from every perspective, from like you're saying, mold making, painting, um, all that stuff. And and um, uh, but you know, I, I think it was maybe at the older shops that I worked at um, that I kind of floated around at that I kind of would. But I've done everything. I mean, I've I've gotten to art direct. I've I've been called in to just sculpt hands for a show. I've been sculpt. I've been called in to just sculpt, uh, you know, bodies or whatever. Like, for example, like uh, Hellboy, the the new reboot of, of that film didn't do so well. But, um, uh, you know, I, I just got hired to do the body. So I sculpted the 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 body on on David Harbor. Um, and, you know, a friend of mine helped come in and kind of finish doing veins and final detail but uh so yeah i mean i i'm kind of uh all in on it and i don't really care if they have me art direct or or, or do the the whole character or just be part of it and just sculpt you know so it, it's all good to me it's probably why you have such a, a long career and you always get hired on jobs it seems like you're you don't put the ego in front you just kind of you know whatever whatever they want whatever they ask of you and, and you're willing to do it and do a good job and obviously probably not much drama or anything like that so it's uh i think it's important for the industry absolutely yeah yeah and i feel i feel the same way you know about film i mean you know i i don't know if i told you guys but i got to do a little short film last year in new york I, I saw a clip of it on your Instagram. That's, that's the only thing I saw. Yeah, I'll, I'll send you. I'll send you the link to the short if you want to watch it. You guys, both of you. Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah. But I mean, it was, you know, as we both have talked about. I mean, you you're working on a, a, a personal uh, love project of yours um, that you'd like to see manifest in some time, and and. You know, I, I love directing too. I was um, I've directed you know numerous little short films throughout the years, and um, you know this little short that that I wrote and directed last year in in New York. I also did the the practical effects myself. I sculpted an alien, and and um, you know I orchestrated and kind of art directed the costume, and and I hired. Um, a, a 2d artist to help me with the costume he did different iterations of the costume and we kind of you know t mix and mash kind of uh, elements from you know the other ones to to make what it was in the film but that was it was so much fun it's like directing it, it's i never get I, I i wanted to keep going all night long but i couldn't because my producer <laughs> Hey, we have SAG rules here, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, these kids have to go home. Like, <laughs> for like, and it, it was SAG. It was it was SAG. It it was literally a dream come true. Like I I it got me in the into the directors guild, and and uh, I was like, wow, like this is this is so surreal right now. I I can't even, like, you know, I I don't I don't know what to think sometimes, but. You know, it hasn't led to anything else, but 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 you know, it, it uh, it's like one of those other things that it came true, and and you know, I had a crew of like 25, 30 people, and it was it was so much fun. We all had so much fun together. You know, it was a five day shoot, um, and but 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 what was really close to me was creating that alien, and. You know, even though my producer wanted to cut it completely out of the film, because because <laughs> he doesn't believe in the 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 idea of suspension of disbelief. Uh, you know, I come from a very kind of Spielberg kind of inspired background. Like, yeah. you know, I mean, Spiel. If you take Spielberg and you take Martin Scorsese, they're two fucking different filmmakers. Okay, they're 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 you know like. Scorsese would never do a movie about an alien that comes down and meets a kid called E.T. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and, and Spielberg would never, well, maybe, but, I mean, he wouldn't do the types of films that Scorsese does, you know? So, 
so you know my producer he he doesn't believe in that stuff and and he wanted to cut out my alien completely which was really kind of heartbreaking in the sense that you know what i really i really worked fucking hard on this alien like and i wrote the story it's about this you know little girl everybody thinks she's crazy and nobody believes her that she sees this alien and all this stuff and and uh you know, um, but, you know, I fought for it and he, he didn't give me that much shit about it. But, um, you know, yeah. it's like, OK, like this is this is the type of filmmaker. If I do a film, this is the type of film that these are the types of films that I like, you know. So if you don't like it, then too bad. <laughs> you know? and, and, and that goes, you know, back to the story about really believing in, 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 in what you love and what you want to do and the voice that you want to project uh is is really sticking to that you know and man like you know we all have different stories you know like i have stories that you know um that aren't as that don't have any suspension of disbelief in them and and um you know it, it's i just love film you know I, I love stories uh good stories and and um you know, I love to be inspired by by uh, films. I the the most recent film I, I I'd say I've been really inspired by is Joker. Have you guys seen that? Yeah, I, I did. It was, uh, it was I, a I, really good dark film. I've also seen it. I I have um an opposite of opinion as as most people. I I didn't really like it. Now let me let me defend myself a little bit. I appreciated it. Yeah. I understood what was happening. But there was a side of me that did not like the idea of rooting for a villain. Like I couldn't get on board with that. It was it was hard. Yeah, and and, and I totally know what you mean. And, and I went back and forth with, <laughs> with with this too. But if you, the way I kind of de- deconstructed it was this way: is I really, I was like, you know what? He's not even the Joker till like the last ten minutes of the film. Yeah. Oh, spoiler alert. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you know what I mean? Like he, if you, and I said this to my, I met with my producer from the short film yesterday morning, but for, for breakfast, but I was like, have you seen Joker? And, and, you know, we we're talking about it a little bit and blah, 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 and this and that. And, and I said, if you really, uh, if you strip away the name and you strip away that he puts, you know, the, the Joker "Quote unquote makeup at, uh, at the end, it's not really a Joker film because, and the reason why I kind of had to sugarcoat it and kind of tell that to my producer is because he comes from a very like him and his wife, you know, they don't really like movies like Spielberg makes or suspension of disbelief. They, they like dramas, they like realistic stuff, which is fine. I love those films too, um, but you know, they don't really." they don't really believe in that stuff. And I, and I kind of had to kind of say, I asked him, I was like, have you seen Joker? And he said, no, I haven't seen it. And I said, well, if you take away the name and blah, 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 it's just about this guy kind of descending to the deep end. Uh, it's a character piece, blah, blah, blah. We've all heard that. And, um, and it's just to take away all that stuff. It's, it's a good film on its own. And I think that's kind of how I try to see it for myself. And I and I completely know what you mean, um, Jeff. But um, you know, uh, I, I just I, I've seen it five times, and and uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I I just thought it was a good solid film. I mean, yeah, I'm sure there was like there's that whole thing. It, I, you know what I was actually worried about, Jeff? I yeah. was really worried about because. This happened on the Dark Knight Rises. Uh, yeah. The guy walked into the theater and started shooting up all these people. And I was actually worried uh, about that. Like, and and that happened years ago. And that thought actually entered my mind when I was watching the movie or about to watch the movie. Um, that wow, like okay, what what if somebody walks in? You you never know. But it it didn't do any of that. Well, why is that? What what is the what what is what is the psychology behind that? In the sense that people didn't really. I mean, 
you know, to my knowledge, I haven't heard anything bad come from uh, from anybody watching that film. Um, but but yes, I, I, I thought the exact same thing as you, you know. But I I think when I broke it down and I saw it from a different perspective, uh, as, as an artist perspective, like for example, like if Martin Scorsese did this film, you know, how would people feel about it? Right. Yeah. No, I, I definitely see it. Yeah, and I think I thought it was a great piece of art. It just in my, you know, it was just weird. And I think you, you mentioned like the, you know, it causing people to do crazy things. I think there were some protests or something about it, or, or yeah. like, uh, yeah. yeah, I think some like parental uh, yeah. like groups and stuff like wanted to try and ban it, or at least not ban it, but I think they put out some kind of statement saying like we don't approve of this kind of thing. But yeah, like you was said, nothing, nothing happened. Bad happened? No, um, nothing bad happened. I, in the time I saw it, there was two cops in the back of the theater waiting, like they were ready. Like, like it was kind of a thing that I know a lot of theaters were doing, kind of preparing for stuff. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, oddly enough, nothing major happened. Yeah, what, what, which is awesome that that it didn't that we just enjoy a movie. Um, one thing I wanted to ask before we we have to wrap up is, uh, you know, you you're really interested in these supernatural strange movies and, and as i am uh have you had any experiences with with supernatural or aliens or anything that you care to share you know i <laughs> yeah you want to hear it <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely. yeah um uh there, there's a few things but you know i mean i don't know if this is like you're just still dreaming or what but um when I was a kid, um, there was like a supernatural thing that happened. And, um, you know, um, uh, we, we had moved into, uh, we, we, uh, I, I, I grew up in the, in the, in the early seventies in, in, in LA. Um, we lived in, um, uh, the city of Linwood. Um, I don't know if you guys heard of that place, but, it's right next to Compton. So I was actually born in Compton, believe it or not. I was okay. born in Compton. My sister and I, Veronica, were, were born in Compton Dominguez Hospital. But we lived in the next city over, which was Linwood. And then, um, you know, in, in, um, uh, in like the late 70s, I think the area just started kind of getting bad. Or, you know, it, it's like every town kind of goes through waves of you know of these things and and my parents ended up my dad my dad had um owned a little bit of property and he ended up selling all of his property and we all ended up moving to a place called walnut which is um <clears throat> it's about 45 minutes east of uh of la and um we you know my dad he sold all his property and we ended up buying um, a brand new house in Walnut. It was a four bedroom home. Um, you know, there was my, you know, both my parents and like five kids. So, <laughs> so we needed, we definitely needed the space. I have three older sisters and a younger brother. My brother and I shared a room and my sisters, uh, two of my sisters shared a room and then my older sister Pilar got her own room. Um, and then anyway, but it was a brand new house, but there was something a little bit like kind of off about there was a, a, a weird kind of feeling that I would get around that house, even though it was brand new. You wouldn't think that, right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, I remember I needed to, I had to go to the bathroom really bad one night, but I was afraid of going in the hallway. And my brother and I had bunk beds and I was in the bottom bed and he was on the top and I just remember one evening um or one night I had to go to the bathroom and I was scared to go in the bath <laughs> I was scared to go to the bathroom and then finally I I I got enough guts to kind of start to get up and go and as I start to look at the doorway as I'm getting up you know I'm, pu I'm pulling the sheets uh, you know the blanket off of myself and I'm about to get up I see this. I see this woman staring at me from around the doorway. <laughs> a very ghostly woman, and I was 
you know, and maybe it was a thing, you know, when your kids, I haven't seen anything weird lately or ever since I've been older, but you know, kids, they, they seem, they say that they're more perceptive yeah. uh, towards these things and stuff. So maybe it was part of that, but, but she was kind of peeking around the corner and I'm kind of getting the chills right now thinking about it, but, but, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I, I, I saw this thing and then like, I don't know, this, so that happened, and I, I think I remember telling my parents about it, you know, years ago, and then and then uh, years ago, probably like eight years ago, or maybe a little bit longer. My ex-wife and I, we went to my my folks' house with the kids, and um, you know, it was my mom and my ex-wife and myself were at the 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 little kitchen table, and we we're all kind of talking about. Um, different things and and the story came up about hey mom remember when i was a kid and i saw that ghost yeah and and uh she's like yeah she's like you were really freaked out and this and that and she's like hold on i'll be right back um so then she comes back and she brings you know she comes she comes back and she opens her hand and and, and there's this little necklace and uh I, and you know, she's like, I found this in the backyard uh, when I was gardening one time in the backyard. And I was like, well, well, what is that? She's like, she's like, and I, you know, my mom, my mom was very intuitive too. Like she, she saw a ghost with, with her mom when there were, when she was little, her mom wasn't, but uh, she was little. So my mom would kind of, you know, maybe there was this kind of weird connection, spiritual connection that we had when we were kids, you know? So, so she, you know, I asked my mom, I'm like, what, you know, what is that? Or what do you believe it is? She's like, I found this buried in the backyard um, when I was gardening at that house and she had it. She still probably has it to this day, but she believes that this, and I, I have no idea where my mom gets this from, but I think it's this kind of, feeling and intuition that she came up with this story but she believes that this woman got murdered and buried in in what used to be our house then orange tree fields mm. <laughs> and 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 she believes that that the ghost that i saw is what was there and i was yeah. like oh i was like oh, why did you tell me that <laughs> <laughs> So it's a really interesting story, and I don't, I don't know, like, but I, I do remember this though. My mom telling me this that whenever you know, she, my mom used to at the time. I know you guys got to go, but um, really quick. But um, my mom used to, uh, um, she used to work nights, so she during the day she'd be home, like sleeping, napping, and it was a brand new house. So, but like on my dad's side of the bed, along along his side. Um, you know, they didn't nail down the floorboards or whatever. It was a brand new house, but they didn't nail down the boards or whatever all the way. So, um, you know, when a anybody ever walked on my dad's side of the bed, like, it would creak. And my mom was home one day, and, uh, you know, she'd work nights and, you know, whatever. But sh she was home one day, and she was napping, and all of a sudden she, she heard that, you know, creaking. And then she felt like this coldness, like somebody laid next to her that, you know, had been in a freezer. Like she wow. felt this chill next to her. And it's just, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I kind of want to, I think because I kind of want to believe that stuff, but, and I'm not skeptical, but it seems like a lot of people that I've talked to or friends or whatever that are really skeptical they never see that stuff. So, but I think I'm because I'm so mo more open minded to that stuff. Maybe I saw that, or I don't know. Maybe it was the art, or who knows? Yeah. No, I, I've had lots of lots of things happen. Jeff's a, a full skeptic, and and I'm the opposite. <laughs> so it's a it's a good dynamic. It's a real Laurel and Hardy situation. <laughs> but, <laughs> so yeah, I'm always I'm always a complete skeptic, and Gus is the complete opposite. I love it. Okay, so you don't believe in that stuff, Jeff, right? Because you no. You, and, and you could say that you've never seen anything, right? Correct. And I don't discount your story. I, I believe that's what you think you saw. 
mm-hmm. <laughs> if that makes sense. But yeah, um, yeah, it's funny with go and you know we're not we're not like pressed for time. If, if you have to go, you have to go. But you know we're. We, we're a little bit flexible, but I'll, I'll, I'll throw a thought experiment at you. And Gus and I were talking about this a little bit. So let's say, have, by the way, I don't have to go. I'm having fun. Uh, okay. So let, let's say, um, the little old lady ghost that was murdered at your house, obviously she was hanging around the house, right? So like she was yeah. murdered in the garden and then, you know, she, she likes to haunt the house or whatever it is. So right. let's say you well, took, well, well, but Jeff, before you go into this, I don't know what you're going to say. <laughs> <laughs> the house, the house is brand new, is what he said. That's the first thing he said. Right. So Jeff, so I look at it from a logical point of view, right? That's that's how I that's how I do things. You you like <laughs> math? I like math. You know, it's it's logical. It makes sense. One one plus one is always equal to two. But if you ask Gus, he might tell you different. Um. <laughs> so so I'd say that so here's just there's a thought experiment. So this ghost, whatever reason, maybe it was haunted. It was killed in the backyard. The house was built. It started haunting the house. Now let's say you took the roof off of the house. Does the ghost right. still haunt the house? If you took the roof off? Yeah, the entire roof. Does the ghost still haunt the house? Yes. Okay. If you, What if you took off all of the windows and the roof? Does the ghost still haunt the house? I, I think it's more of where maybe she died, you know? Okay, because so let's... If you remove the entire house... Does does the ghost still hang out around the area where it was killed? You know what? I, I think it's like people are kind of magnetic to each other in the sense that, I mean, look at, I'm just speculating. I'm trying to explain what you just said um, or trying to make, you know, some sense in my head what you just said. But I I, I feel like we're like magnets, right? Like if, if you obviously... How long have you guys known each other? About nine years. So there's also, so there's a friendship connection between you guys, right? Yeah. Sure. A cousin of mine a long time ago, she used to read tarot cards and all that shit, you know? And, and, uh, and I think I was telling her about something or whatever. She's like, you know what, Mario? She's, she's like, you're, you're a very positive person. And because you're a very positive person, and you know, again, like I don't know if this is all bullshit, but but I'm just talking. About <laughs> uh, she's like, you're a very positive person, which I do feel like I am. And she's like, you attract you attract a lot of negative energy, and think of it like a magnet. It, there's a there's a positive energy force, and there's a negative energy force. Those two are going to connect because merely, like that's just kind of. Um, uh, I can't think of the word, but um, uh, a scientific word that I'm trying to think of that I can't think of because <laughs> I'm not a scientist. But you know, there's that there's that magnetic connection between the two, and and if you think that you know, if you take away the house and you take away the walls and the windows and all that stuff, like you're saying, you know, if this person was, because think about it, like if if you were gonna die. The, the thing that people, I, I think, I believe that they say when they're going to actually really die is that they say that they don't want to die. So that you stay kind of like in this weird kind of trap limbo. And then when people come around, you kind of gravitate towards them like a magnet because it's the spiritual kind of magnet. You know, who knows? I don't know. I might be just, I'm sure I'm just full of shit, but I'm just saying what I feel, you know. And I think, yeah. like, as human beings that, you know, we gravitate towards certain people because we, we there's something that about them that we like and we, we kind of gravitate towards them that maybe this entity or whatever that died. Because, I mean, look at, my mom hadn't told me about this till many, many years later. I'm talking about 20, 25 years later, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and we were both, like, on the same kind of page as far as this thing that, you know, she feels died there, you know, this person. Um, so, you know, I, I, I don't know. I think, I think that because maybe, uh, and again, I'm just, you know, brainstorming here, but maybe 
maybe the thought of, of this energy, which was people just somewhere around there at the time, even before we were there, um, that, uh, you know, she was kind of trying to make a connection with somebody, anything that could, could remotely recognize that she was there. Yeah. And I, I, I agree with a lot of what you're saying too. And, you know, my own, my own like weird, I think we always come up with our own weird, uh, ideas of it. Like I always felt like it's not that the full person, her energy is there. Maybe her consciousness isn't even there, but usually when a traumatic experience happens, I think it takes that energy of them that, Oh, like they just that freak out. Like I've been murdered. And, and that maybe that energy lingers, you know, where the other, the other part of the energy uh, leaves, if that makes sense. Uh, it almost seems that way to me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I would, I would, I would guess that that's what would be part of it. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe this lady could have attached to you and it's been following you around, but can only be seen as a child. And so since you're not a child, she's still around, but you just can't know. Oh gosh, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I want to believe in the unbelievable, you know, the, you know, I think I, everybody does. It's, it's, a, yeah. it's a sense sense of imagination, a sense of wonder, you know, exactly. Think about yeah. that well, and it also goes back to what you were saying earlier with your dream. You know, you had this dream and, and maybe you didn't even understand it fully at first. That, and then you realize it later, like, wow, I've, I was here. You know, it's kind of, I think that in enough. And the same thing when you asked me about my style when I was younger, I'd close my eyes and I'd see these things. I feel like a lot of creative types, too, are, we're almost a little bit in that side of things. We, we're almost... And when we're open to that connection of the, there's more to all this. It's not just, uh, you know, you go for a drive and everything looks pretty fucking boring. To me, it does anyways. Like, you just, oh, it's all the same shit. <laughs> so yeah. I think as a creative, you're, our minds are kind of uh, tuned into something else. And I think that helps us exactly. along. And not, and not to say that, Jeff, that you're not that. I, 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 I think there's something there with you that you're really excited about and interested in it, but but you, you haven't had anything happen to fully convince you. And Jeff, I wanted to ask you really quick, what, what is your kind of, what is your kind of background? Um, well, so I, my, what I have a degree in is, is 3d animation. So I do like uh, 3d modeling and animation. Cool. Um, but then I also do like traditional sculpting and I've done like mold making and casting and painting and stuff like that um, on the right. side. But so I've, I've kind of, I kind of dabble in everything. Um, so yeah, I guess a generic term is just, you know, like the podcast says, I'm a creator. That's I great. just like to make stuff. Yeah. And he's kind of downplaying. I mean, he's, he's really multi-talented. Uh, and he's, when he puts his energy into something, like he started pumpkin carving just because he liked that show pumpkin wars. And That's then he would, and then he was on the show and they, they, you know, they asked him back again, but he didn't, he just didn't want to do it anymore. He is, his heart wasn't there for it again. He already did it. Uh, but a lot of stuff like that, where he'll not know how to do it, goes for it, you know, nails it. That, that's the reason why he was at Jim Henson Studios is is uh, he, they had a contest and he won the contest and, and you know, wow, that, that kind of thing. Are you on Instagram? Uh, yeah, I'm I'm on uh, at Version Thirst. I think I'm probably on your list of uh, recently liked your stuff. <laughs> can you can you please send me a message? I'll I'll follow you back. I'd yeah, love yeah. I'll, I'll spend it, but yeah, so, I, I'm I'm always I'm always the skeptic. So I, I we're a nice balance. We're a yin and yang. I think we balance out really well, Gus and I. Well, yeah, and we, <laughs> well, maybe Gus and I will change your mind later. <laughs> <laughs> it'd be fun. It'd be fun. We'll, we'll, make, we'll, you, we'll make you a true believer. <laughs> well, I oh, like actually, I, I I met the guy that did the Crypt Kicker voice on uh, Halloween Wars. <laughs> did you really? I, I can't hit the name. His name. Uh, I can't think of his name right now, but yeah, he he was really awesome. <laughs> oh my gosh, can I tell you guys something really quick? <laughs> so when I worked for Kevin Yeager, I, I I you know he had the Crypt Keeper puppet, you know, in the shop and stuff, and I I love that thing, man. I was like, I was a total nerd, like, oh my god, I can't believe I'm actually looking at this thing, blah blah blah, and you know, like Kevin did a an amazing job sculpting it and the detail and the pores and the texture and blah. 
you know, I was going crazy. <laughs> and, and, um, and I started kind of, you know, trying to emulate the, the guy who did the voice, like, Hello, kitties. Time for a new ghoulish tale. <laughs> it's really good. That's really good. Yeah. And I would joke around. And I do. My throat's hurting, by the way, right now. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but I would do that for Kevin. And 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 then Kevin goes one day. He's like, "Wow." He's like, "Oh, wow, that's pretty good." And he's like, "He's like, did I ever tell you that I I actually cast that guy to do the voice?" I was like, "What? No way!" And 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 he started telling me. He's like, "Yeah." He's like, "Um." uh the the studio didn't want anything to do with it they're like you do it you know <laughs> you be the director right so then you know kevin uh he auditioned like i don't know over 40 guys right that all did different voices and one of the and gosh I'm, i feel bad for not remembering his uh, voice john kassir well john kassir was the guy who did the voice but he told me that uh, I don't remember the gentleman's name that 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 was in those police academy movies that I saw as a kid. Oh, but, Michael Winslow. Yeah, he did all. He yeah, did yeah, all, yeah, yeah, Michael yeah. Winslow. Yeah, he told me that he auditioned for, it and I was like, "What? That's awesome!" <laughs> and you know, he started telling me the story, and then you know, uh, and he's like, "Yeah, he's like, uh, once I heard John Cassier do the voice, he's like, I knew that that guy was it, and I and we hired him on the spot." Oh, I was like, that's awesome. That's fantastic. That's so cool. It's just one of those stories that you hear, you know, it's like, ah, I wish I would have been there to just, you know, if I was sculpting in the background while Kevin was auditioning these guys, I wish I would have been. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I think what happens with that kind of stuff is no one knows how special those moments are as they're happening. Cause they're all just trying to like, Oh, I'm just trying to get this gig, this job. And you don't know it's going to be a big thing or, or people are going to care about it and have this legacy. So it's, you know, oh it's God. like, yeah. I, I've I've just heard like uh, on Sleepy Hollow, uh, Martin Landau came in. Can I tell you guys a story really quick? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. So you guys know Martin Landau, right? Yeah. He's... Martin Landau like was on like Space 1999. He was in Sleepy Hollow. You know, he's just. I mean, he passed away now, but he came in for Sleepy Hollow, um, and uh, he started telling us. You know, he used to date Marilyn Monroe. And I was like, in my head, I was like, what the fuck? No way. I was like tripping out. I was geeking out major. And uh, he just started telling us this, you know, he's like, when he used to date Marilyn Monroe and uh, quote unquote, Marilyn Monroe. Uh, but, you know, he went to go pick. He started telling us a story where he went to. They were going to go on a date, and he went to go pick her up one day, and um, and uh, he shows up at her place, and and she's she, she you know she's looking beautiful, wearing this nice dress and this and that, and and uh, she goes, she's like, "What do you think of this dress?" And he and he goes, um, "He's like, wow, he's like, you look amazing. Like, we let's go. We got we you know, we got reservations or whatever." And she's like, hold on, I, I don't know, I don't know if I really want to wear this dress. And I, I don't know exactly verbatim what he exactly said. I'm just, you know, the broad strokes of the, the story. But uh, and he goes, uh, or she, she goes, hold on a second, I, I gotta try. It. I, I tried on this other dress before. Let me try it on. Let me show it to you. He's like, okay. So, <laughs> I mean, she does this like three or four five times and, and as beautiful as she was like she was immensely insecure about herself and uh, i was like what no way like i'm thinking like you know she she i i'm thinking like i don't i didn't know marilyn Monroe, but i was just thinking all throughout as he was telling the story that she must have been you know it's like this incredibly and i'm sure she was strong woman like really you know confident in herself and this and that but you know she she really didn't as far as he was saying that she didn't really think that about herself and i was like wow like that's that's incredible that you know i, I would never have thought that you know she just seems so she seemed to me anyways like as an artist like this perfect sculpture that you know, just 
had no flaws at all, you know? And, 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 and I think that, you know, as artists, we're all kind of hard on ourselves and we just want to strive to do better or whatever. But it's like, it just blows me away that, that, um, you know, these stories that you hear and, and, um, it's like, I got to hear that story from Martin Landau. That's really fucking cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. It's, it's like, uh, just those awesome moments. And, and a lot of people wouldn't realize that at all, you know, and you never know what it's like to be in other people's minds, you know, how, how they feel about going about every day. Absolutely. And, and just, you know, this is an overall, like, you know, life stories, you know, we all, we all have our stories and our journeys that, 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 we go through in life and um you know uh just hearing about everybody's stories is just it's so inspiring to me you know uh, as a person as a human being as an artist to, to to experience those little moments of everybody's or different people's lives yeah i think that's why we love we love movies so much and and before that it was books i think uh we want it's like we want to find this story of our life and, and sometimes we don't get to do everything. So, you know, yeah. we, could, we could explore that through, through film, through a, a great song or, or a book. But I mean, film, I think for, for all three of us probably is our, our favorite medium to experience that kind of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, th- this is, this has been amazing, Mario. I, I've uh, enjoyed the conversation and, uh, you know, would love to have you come back sometime uh eventually as well it's been a lot of fun i've had a i've had a great time thanks guys thank you so much for for letting me be a part of this and and uh i look forward to the next one (laughs) yeah thanks so much it's been it's been awesome getting to to know you know a little bit behind the scenes and and a lot about you and talking about ghosts and other cool stuff um but yeah we'll have to have have you come back cool man thanks guys thank you thanks a lot